So, Paul, we can build some really big dishes. Maybe we could even make some small ones that are perfectly directed at Earth, and we can transmit data, right? OK. So now we have to decide what frequency we're going to use. Don't we just use radio? Well, I mean, there is radio, but there's all sorts of different sorts of radio. I see you've got a nice plot of it here. <laughs> um, so we've got uh, one end, the very low frequency VLF radio, which is um, 100 kilometer to 10 kilometer wavelengths. So these are those really, really, really long wavelengths that you were kind of mentioning. Yep. Now, now these ones are not good for space communication because right. they don't get through the ionosphere of the Earth. Also, if you want to send a signal that's got a wavelength of 100 kilometers, you need an antenna that's about 100 kilometers big. And indeed, that's what they do. These are used for things like communicating with submarines because yep. it's one of the few radio waves that can go under the water. Yep. And they were often, I know in outback Australia, they basically have a phone line on a bunch of cables that extends for hundreds of kilometers. It's used to send 100 kilometer long radio signals out to, out to submarines. That's right. So that's generally why on Earth we have these giant towers, because it doesn't really matter if we're directed. We just actually want to broadcast it as far as, wide as we can see. Yeah. So very long frequency, useful but not useful for space. That's right, but by the time we're down, even one kilometer, you're having trouble penetrating. But down, up to a few megahertz frequency, so wavelengths of 100 meters or so, now you can get into space. That's right. And in fact, we often get, say, television signals from space. We often, if there's ever a solar storm that interrupts our satellites, people panic because they've lost their uh, cable or satellite provider. Yep. And part of the trouble is that this is also, in some sense, the history of radio. Yes because the very early radio telescopes, so not radio telescopes, radio transmitters used the lower frequencies, and as the technology advanced, they moved to higher and higher frequencies. What that means is down here at the low frequencies, it tends to be very heavily used. Yes. There's um, radio, communications, navigation, telephony, TV. So these frequencies, the trouble is you're competing against you. Saturday night football on the television, <laughs> That's and right. competing against uh, classic FM and all the so other radio stations. So lots of sources of yeah, interference and essentially light pollution that can interfere with your signal. So if you're trying to detect that really faint one in a billion or one in a trillion signal from Mars, you're probably going to get interrupted if you try and listen to, as I said, when the football is being broadcasted on. Yes. And there's also, you don't just send signals at one particular frequency. Well, you can, but then you're going to have very small bit rates. What you normally do is you use a range of frequencies. Yes. This is called the bandwidth. Yes. So instead of sending you a signal at 300 megahertz, I might send it between 300 and 310. Yes. And by using a wider range of frequencies, I can send a lot more data to you. And it still can be picked up by the same receiver because it could still hear those or listen to those or see those or detect those yep. radio waves transmitting from you. Yes, yeah, so most receivers won't just pick up a single frequency. They'll have a whole bunch of channels and electronics that picks up a whole bunch of different frequencies close to each other. And this is no different than when we talked about uh, in another section of the STARS course looking at optical colors, right? Green is actually broken up into smaller wavelengths that you can actually detect even to the physical element. So radio waves are... Yep. The same. Yeah. So ideally, you would use the whole spectrum. <laughs> use everything from here to here. And if you collect all that, you get a large amounts of data. Yes. The trouble is most of the data you're going to get its interference from radio and TV stations. This radio frequencies are heavily fought yes. over commodities. That's right. If you right. want to set up a new mobile phone channel, you're going to need to get some frequencies that aren't being used by the military radars or by something else. And in fact, this is kind of what people do is they segment different chunks of the radio band and the radio frequency says, yes, I'm only going to have this for my defense. Weather satellites, they operate at a very specific frequency and everyone says, okay, weather satellites, you can do that. But if you're tra trying to listen to these things that are even further away past it, you have to find the gaps in these channels or those bands to listen to it. And certain f channels are reserved yes. for these sort of communications. Yes. They're very small. We'd like them to be much bigger. But if we made the bands that we use bigger, that would mean that someone wouldn't get their mobile phone or they wouldn't get their military radar or something. So it's... Uh, um, I know there was an idea once that uh, what we should do is take all the bands that are used by radio astronomy and sell them to mobile phone providers. <laughs> and the amount of money we would make from this is enough to let every radio astronomer in the world retire on a multi-million dollar income. And that's because there's very specific radio frequencies in astronomy that we'd like to listen to, and they are preserved in this whole band and in the spectrum. Yes, so there, uh, there are certain bands set aside for radio astronomy and for spacecraft communications yes. and the like and we have to you constantly doing lawsuits to try and keep them free from other forms of interference um, 
but it's, they're, they're very lucrative, and the amount of money involved in space is very small compared to that of buying your mobile phones and other things like That's that. Right. And uh, so if the radio astronomers went to sleep and didn't pay attention, we'd wake up the next morning and find that it was being used for something that's commercially far more valuable. So we have the issue, not only could we just have to find and build something that can listen or see or detect this very faint radio signal, we have to find the right gaps in the frequencies to detect it. And we have to find the right gaps amongst all the other satellites that are out there transmitting on those same frequencies as well. So it kind of gets a bit complicated to talk to your favorite satellite in space or your favorite astronaut on the moon. And there's also a trade-off in different frequencies. I mean, the, the higher frequencies, the really high frequencies, tend to be less crowded yep. because it's technologically harder to broadcast or receive at those frequencies. Um, so they're less crowded. There's more empty space there for us to use. Also, because it's a higher frequency, that means a shorter wavelength. Yep. And it turns out that a fraction means you can therefore send a tighter beam out. So these are, are better. The trouble is they tend to get more blocked by water vapor and things in the atmosphere, and the receipt technology is harder. So you can improve your detection and you're listening to satellites as you go up, but it's more costly and more technologically involved. Whereas taking your little antenna and sending it out in a field, well, you can probably pick up something. It's going to be a low easily. frequency, but it's, it's going to be able to transmit less data. It's going to yes. send it. You need a bigger dish to send the signals in the right direction. So there's a lot of trade-offs between what you want, how much you want it, and where and what you're listening to. So we have to have different types of receivers and satellites, as we slightly saw at Tidman Villa, to go and look for these things.